last couple of weeks we've been talking from, well, from Matthew 23 to 24, and in the beginnings of Matthew 24, from last week's message, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's looking at the temple and the buildings of the temple, and they were uh, extremely special to the Jewish people that represented where they could identify with God's presence. And Jesus said to them something that was just unthinkable. He said that every one of those stones of that building and those buildings were going to be torn down. So his disciples asked him three questions. Firstly, when will those things be? He's talking about, they were talking about the destruction of the temple, basically. But then they added two more questions. They also said, when will your coming be and what will be the sign of your coming? The end of the age as well. And Matthew 24, Jesus addresses several of these things. And there's kind of a, uh, uh, when you're in the theological world in seminaries and Bible colleges, they said that prophecies oftentimes were like, standing on one mountaintop looking across the way at other mountaintops and you can see maybe two or three or four mountaintops but you don't see everything that's in between the valleys that would be there and and they were right prophecy oftentimes was like that the prophets would see things that may have application to that moment possibly application for a nearer moment not far down the road and then application possibly for way down the road and God didn't always try to clarify that when the prophets spoke. Even we have the obvious evidence of that in the New Testament. The apostles were very clear that they expected the coming of the Lord to be very soon. And we do believe there was, in, in a sense, a coming of Christ at, at uh, 70 AD. But the question that I posed last week that I will not try to answer all of at this point is was that the ultimate and final? And I don't believe it was. Now, I do believe it was a coming, and I believe it answered uh, quite a lot of the earlier portions of Matthew 24. But Jesus, in being a prophet as well as the Messiah, when he spoke, he spoke the word that were alive. They were true. But he didn't always try to differentiate, this is going to happen here and this is going to happen here. But what he did tell his guys, and I shared this last week, he said, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will show you things to come. And so Jesus, on more than one occasion, told his disciples, he said, I have a lot more that I want to tell you, but you can't really handle it right now. It's not time to tell you now. He said, when it comes to pass, then you'll know. So this is oftentimes how God works with us. Now, Jesus, having said all of that in Matthew 24 that I read last week, then again, I didn't try to differentiate with you what I thought all of those words mean, meant, at least in the time scale. I didn't try to do that on purpose. But he's going to follow. He's not finished. Matthew chapter 25, he's not finished with the question, when will you come? So he's going to talk about this more, and he's going to give them a parable. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. I want to say this again. It wasn't long ago in this, this, chap, this letter when Jesus was talking about the eternal wedding. He's the groom, the church is his bride, and he was talking about it then. It is how all of the typology in the Bible ends in the Revelation is with that great wedding, the wedding of Christ and his church, his bride. So Jesus is going to talk about it again. This is a big deal. It is a big deal for him, and it's a big deal for us said there were ten virgins. They took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise. Five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps with no oil within them. Now, we understand that in their day, uh, they, their lamps were, had some kind of, of oil that it burned, kind of like we would have fuel today, to cause that light to shine. And it said five of them didn't take in their lamps oil. But the wise, they took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now in the scripture, many times, oil is a metaphor for the person of the Holy Spirit. Now not entirely always that, that way, but oftentimes. The person of the Holy Spirit uh, was a type of 
the oil of God's presence. So that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. <clears throat> then all those virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps they are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. Go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves, which is what they should have been doing all along. While they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, that would be Jesus, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. So Jesus culminates this by saying, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. See, he's following still with answering their question. But he's not giving them time reference. He is saying it's going to happen, and he's saying some of the ingredients of what it will look like when it happens. But he said, let me give you a parable. Uh-oh. As they say, rut row. We're looking out the window, and there's a guy out there that's got a big flat tire in his Jeep, and, and we're going to pray for him. In fact, we already have. Back to my message. The Son of Man is coming, he said. This was a consistent message of Jesus. It's, it was a very consistent message of the apostles. There's great debate today as to what that all means, and was there just one of those comings? Or I know this to be true. There have been many comings of God throughout history. He would come in the Old Testament at times personally. He would come through an angelic form, being, he would come through sometimes foreign armies. He would come to speak in ways. He would come as a fire on the mountain with Moses or a fire in the bush. He came in lots and lots and lots and lots of ways. And you know something? He still is. I was mowing the yard about, I don't know, 20 years ago, and that seems to be one of those places among a couple of others where God likes to talk to me. And I'm mowing the yard, and he said to me, Son, I've had a lot of comings. Well, why did I think that? Well, we're talking about a lot of what the New Testament spoke of as the coming of Christ. He said, I've had a lot of comings. And I've, I think, seen a few since then of some times in my own personal life and maybe in the evidence of God working in His world where there's a coming, a presence, an appearing of sorts. And Jesus is still answering this question. He's still dealing with it. And how this question really is best resolved is not about do you have it all figured out when it's going to happen but do you know him kelly was talking about believing in him as i've said on numerous occasions one of the things that god did to help me as a young pastor because there are many ways we can do we can describe how a person is born again they're saved they're born again they're they're a believer uh, Romans 10 talks about if you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. These are all true. But one of the things that really stands out to me are the words of Jesus himself. That we know him or we don't. Now there are people that know him, but they know him more as a child, as an infant. And I'm not talking about their their biological age, sometimes there can be people 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old that are still rather immature as Christians, but they do know him. And then there are people that know him that are very mature. So you've got that spread there, but the key is they know him. Now what did Jesus say to the five that were foolish, that hadn't prepared themselves? And I'm going to come back to what that really means, of course. What did he say to them? He said, I don't know you. Now they're thinking he did. We have Jesus' own words at times that after that door was shut, there'd be people knocking on the door saying, let me in. He said, I don't know you. And they're saying, yes, you do. Remember us. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. And he said, no, I never knew you. 
And then he says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's, again, shades of what Kelly was talking about. Those of us that really obey the Lord are those that love the Lord and the ones that know him. So Jesus is answering the question about his coming really more by saying, do you know me or not? Well, what was this oil in the lamp thing all about? That oil represents the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's more than just that you're saved. It's that there's an intimacy with the presence of God himself. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. He also said it's the, it's the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit and Christ are so one that even though they're two separate individuals, and then the third is the Father, three different individuals that are one God. There's nothing in this world that compares to that with the exception of the church. And the church isn't always doing that very well. Three individuals so united, they are one. And that was Jesus' desire for his church to be one with us and then one with one another in such a way that then the world will know that he came from the Father, he was sent by the Father. So, what is this oil in the lamp all about? It's about an ongoing, intimate presence with God. Knowing the Father, knowing the Son, knowing the Holy Spirit, listening, talking to Him and hearing Him. It's about people that are meditating in the Word and spending time with God. It's about people throughout their day and in, even into the night. They're so aware of the presence of God. There's an intimacy of His presence. There's a, there's a knowing Him. Not just knowing about Him. Because I assure you there will be people that want to get in to the eternal heaven to come that, that know about Him, but they don't know Him. There is a difference. And so Jesus is trying to make a point here. He's saying, he, He's going to follow this up and we'll get into this in the next few weeks, more about what it's like while we're waiting in the delay of time. Have you noticed that not all of the miracles that you pray for happen just immediately? Have you noticed that? I have. I've noticed that there are occasions when I'll pray for something and just very quickly there is an answer that comes. And that's beautiful. But what I have found, and I am in good company, I've heard a lot of pretty mature Christian people say the same thing, and that is a lot of times the things that really matter the most, they come with some time. There's prayer, there's, there's intercession, there's supplication, there's waiting on God. And then there are those things that God brings about the answer. Sometimes it's different in the way we were thinking. Because sometimes my problem is I'm trying to figure out how he's going to do it rather than trusting that he will. God is the one that created the heavens and the earth. Can you imagine the infinite wisdom and power and grace of this almighty God? Those of you that have been in the medical field for a while have learned a little bit about the incredible ingenuity of God that created these bodies that we live in. This heart that's beating in front of you right now has been beating for almost 70 years. Just every few seconds it's beating. Isn't that something? Man, we don't have any kind of batteries that can run a car or, or anything else that's, that's like that. The, the beauty of the creation, not only of mankind, but his physical creation. And then the out there, the 50 billion trillion stars and all of the, the massive stuff that we're just barely starting to understand a little bit about, the, the, the forces that control the universe and all creation. It's staggering. Staggering. It's that God, it's that God that we know that lives inside of our hearts and he wants to be intimate with us. And he gives us the ability to do that, to know him, to hear his voice. You guys know what I'm talking about. There are those times when it may not come as an audible voice, you know, out loud God's saying a word and boom, there it is. But there's just that knowing Sometimes it comes in your spiritual mind with, with thoughts that are words. Other times it's just the knowing. There was a, in the earlier days of my experience with the Lord as a young pastor, uh, we were very busy in those days and 
we went home. We lived on uh, Debbie Street at the time in Republic. We'd moved into our first house, and we went to bed, and it would have probably been late, because it usually was, and we'd probably been at church doing something, and then we are going to get up in the morning and go to school and work and do what we do. And I laid down, and I wasn't asleep. I was still awake. And I had a vision. I think it probably was the first time anything like this had ever happened to me. And it was a vision. And what I saw was what it looked like, as best I can describe it, was there was like a map of southwest Missouri and maybe parts of Arkansas and Oklahoma and Kansas, but you know where we live, a map of where we live. And over the top of that, there was this, what looked like a wagon wheel just got put down over the top of it. And the hub of that wagon wheel landed in Springfield. But there were spokes going out from the hub to all of these towns and villages around us to this rim that kind of encompassed this whole area. And I don't recall God speaking a word to me, and it was like instantly I knew hundreds and hundreds of things. Bam! Just like that, he downloaded in me some knowing of some stuff. And what I knew was that was a picture of how the church function and government is supposed to work. So I was in the Assemblies of God, a denomination. I knew of many others, and, and I'm not anti-denomination. But I also know they all have their way of working, and oftentimes these denominational groups, as well as a lot of local churches, don't always get along that well. And what God was showing me is that in the center of that hub, which in this case I saw it as Springfield, although I'm not saying all of them would have to live in Springfield, there would be apostles, prophets, especially those two. And they are connected relationally, which is what the spokes represented, relationally connected to the pastors and leaders, the evangelists, the teachers. And they're all out here in these communities, churches, all over this geographical area, encompassed by the rim. And what I saw was that God wanted his people to be united together as one in the faith. Kelly even brought, on, brought this out a bit ago. The Lord showed me that God is not denominational. Now, he, I'm not saying that he hates denominations. Denominations can, can, can serve a purpose, but oftentimes what happens is we become divided and protective. And that's not how it's supposed to be. So here I am, a young man, probably about 22 or 3, and God's showing me something that I'm not entirely sure what to do with. Still to this day, I'm not entirely sure what all he wants me to do with that and what he's expecting to do. What I do know is that was the Lord. And it was him showing me that he can talk to me. He can reveal things to me. There have been times I just knew something and I just knew I did because it was the Lord. There have been times he actually speaks words to me. You know, I'm not entirely sure if I've ever heard him speak a word out loud to me because you don't really have to have that. When he speaks into the spirit of your mind and you have a word there, you know this is the Lord. And I've had that happen hundreds if not thousands of times. Well, there are five of these virgins that are practicing that. They're practicing being intimate with the Lord. The oil. The oil of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And there are that, these other five, and they're not. They're not doing that. <coughs> There, there may be around people that are, and maybe they're de deceived to think they are too. I saw this when I first started leading worship in the adult congregation many years ago. I had grown up in a family that was musical, so we were all the time around that. When God led me to start working with the kids, the first thing I did, we were downstairs on Wednesday night in, in our building there in Republic, and I would take my guitar and I would sit in front of those kids and we'd sing some basic simple choruses and then I'd share the word. But Wilson came along after a while, and he asked me and wanted me to lead the adult congregation of worship. Well, that was a whole nother critter to me. Because firstly, I was not professionally trained as a musician or a singer, still am not. And I'm a young man, very young. And I'm gonna be leading people now that are twice my age, some of them three times my age, and I know how humans are. Sometimes they kind of resent that, and I didn't want that. So I really wasn't 
all excited about doing it, but I was, I was told to do it, so I did it. And one of the things I noticed when I would look out, and I learned to quit doing that, to look out at the, at the group when I'm leading worship, is I would look out there and I would see all kinds of whatever going on. Now, here's the thing about some people. They can act like, or seem like they're not paying attention when they actually are. But then you can also tell there's some, they're just flat not paying attention. <laughs> we learned that with kids, don't we? And what I saw more than that that kind of troubled me were people that I had known most all of my life that were adults in the Christian arena that named the name of Christ, spoke of being filled with the Spirit, all of these kinds of experiences, that I would look out there and I wasn't seeing evidence of worship. Now again, please know I'm not the ultimate judge of whether a heart's truly worshiping. But then the, the, the release of life. So I, I really saw this, that there was a certain percentage of folks in that room that didn't look like they probably were worshiping the Lord. But you know what? They were standing next to and around people that were. And I think the Lord showed me something. They're so close to it, they think they're doing it. And they're not. That's a real dangerous thing. You know, children grow up in a home and they should grow up with the faith of their parents. And that's a good thing. And the faith of people that are leaders, that's a good thing. But at some point, those children have to take on their own faith, right? They have to know the Lord themselves and they have to take on their own faith. And so I saw that there were people that were in a church that talked about worshiping God and, and demonstrating their worship to God, they really weren't. Now, I'm not saying that they weren't Christian. I'm not saying they weren't born again. And I'm not saying that they wouldn't go to heaven because I don't know about that. But what I do know is it bears a lot on this story right here, this story. I think there are people that have been around it so much, but maybe they're not a part of it. They've been around the worship, but they're really not. They've been around the faith, but you know, they're really not. They even talk the words, but something about it's not quite the same. And so the one that's gonna decide that ultimately is certainly not Rick, it's gonna be the Lord. And Jesus said, there are gonna be some that I'm gonna to have to say, I don't know you. So this parable was given to his disciples and those that were listening to prepare them. So we follow that bride and groom and wedding story up with something that I've shared with you several times. Revelation 19, verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. This is something Jesus is longing to have happen. And so is his bride as well. And it says, his wife has made herself ready. This is important. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Jesus called that a wedding garment back in Matthew 22. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And then this is followed up in Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice those words, prepared and adorned for our husband. Chapter 21, verse 9. Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, the great city, the holy Jerusalem. So here we say that in typology, God is saying not only is she called the bride, but she's also the great city or holy Jerusalem. She's descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. That's such a beautiful statement. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. This is again the preparation of the event that Jesus is talking about. Jesus talked about in Matthew, I think it's probably 22, but it's back earlier. He said, you know, uh, the father, the, the, the master, he starts preparing a wedding for his son. And we, we went through that message a few weeks ago. And Jesus, even when he was here on the earth, forefront of his mind was a day after 
the salvation of the people after his death and burial and resurrection and after he's gone to be with the Father and after the time where there's God preparing the bride here on the earth and that's where this preparation is happening is here we're learning to hear his voice and be intimate with his presence the oil of the Holy Spirit according to that that parable that there will be a time when the bride has made herself ready that's the terminology that is here in the Revelation she has prepared herself she has grown she's mature she is fitting to be married to this permanently perfectly mature husband that's Jesus and let's face it he's fully mature so the preparation of the bride is that she's growing she's maturing so it's more than just that she knows him although that's where it all starts but there's an ongoingness of that knowing him of hearing his voice now we know how it was with Jesus when he was here the intimacy that he had with his, with his father was everything it says in John 1 18 of Jesus that he's the only begotten son who is in the bosom of his father that means he's in his father's heart and then Jesus later in John 10 30 said I and my father are one the secret to your success and my success is the same one that was the secret to Jesus success intimacy with the father and the son in our case and the Holy Spirit that's the secret hearing his voice every day being sensitive to his presence have we ever missed it of course we have there have been times that we've been occupied or maybe even stubborn and have missed those opportunities or missed the words at times. Sometimes I've heard things that were the Lord and I kind of put them aside, either because I didn't know what to do with it, I didn't like it so much, I was afraid of it, whatever you want to say. But then in this preparation of God preparing his bride, one of the things she's doing is she's learning to hear and to be willing to hear. Lord, I want to hear. I want to hear when you speak. Rather than when I was a child, there were times that I would just assume mom and dad wouldn't speak because I was afraid they were going to tell me something I didn't want to do or I didn't like, right? When I was a kid, Kelly dealt with this. My parents, we traveled all over this area singing in churches. And I hated, I hated that on times my dad would make me get up there with him to sing. I didn't want to do that. I was bashful. I was embarrassed. I had allergy problems even back then and my voice would squeak. So there were times I'd take off singing and then I'd never know where my voice was going to go. And it was a lot worse when I was younger. And it was embarrassing. And we don't like to be embarrassed. And so I, uh, he's got the tire fixed and so praise the Lord. <laughs> I didn't like to be embarrassed and I didn't want to do this and I grew to despise the thought that I was going to have to go to a church because we went I don't know how many times in a week to diff not just our church but to many others the fear I mean it was fear in me that I'm sitting back there and God's, dad's going to say Ricky come up here or Ricky and Kelly come up here I, I just hated to hear that I despised it and later on, I told you this when I became a, an adult and God began to work in my heart. The Lord had me go to my dad one night, and I'll never forget this. It was at the church in Republic, and he was sitting in one of the pews after church was over, and I went to him and said, Dad, I, I need to ask you to forgive me for all those times that I resisted you. I wasn't saying to my dad that all of it was absolutely righteous and holy. That's not the point. I was resisting my father and I was being disrespectful and I asked him to forgive me and it made my dad uncomfortable I could tell he said oh that's you know that's okay and I said really no it's not it's not okay Jesus was in such a place with his father that he never did anything but what it was in alignment with his father and he longed to hear the voice of his father and so that is literally how he lived and he is our pattern he's our master and he's the one that 
was and still was God, but he wasn't functioning as God. He always had been. And yet he limited himself such a way that he would become like one of us to do what I'm talking about. And his intimacy with his Father and the person of the Holy Spirit as well was his secret. And so that's what Jesus gave us as the pattern, and that's our pattern. So our intimacy with Jesus, of course, is everything as well. John 15, verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you, Jesus said. And he said, abide in my love. This is important. Live in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. This is Jesus telling us how to do it. Firstly, he gives us his love. He gives us his heart, he gives us his spirit, he gives us his word, he gives us his blood, he gives us his body, he gives us his name. And he said, you need to do what I tell you to do. God is not bashful. This is how God says it. We are to be obeyers. A person that's a true disciple is a person that is an obeyer. And he said, if you do this, then you will abide in my love, that intimacy, that presence. Just as, he says, I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. Paul picks up on this in Ephesians 3 in a prayer he's praying. That God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, he's talking about of love, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge or surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now Paul is saying this is how I'm praying for all of you, that you will be rooted and grounded in the love of God, that intimate presence. It's not just a name or a word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is true. We're to know that love. He said it's, it's important that you know my love, that you are one with my love. He said that you live in my love just like I lived in my father's love. And he said, I want you to comprehend or understand this love. He said, it's like you need to understand the width the length, the depth, and the height of this love. He said, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So that sounds like a, a paradox. To know something that you can't fully know. You can know the love of God, but you can't know all of the end, infinite greatness of the love. It's so, that, it's so great. So you know it, but it still surpasses what you know. Isn't that something? And, and according to Paul, that's absolutely doable. That we can know something that we can't fully know. He picks up on, on that in the Philippian letter. Earlier, I'm going to... Well, let's read chapter 3, verse 8 first. Indeed, I count all things lost, Paul said, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He said, that I may know him. This is Paul talking. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. As you know, this is the guy that in the Jewish world before God got a hold of him, he was, a, he was a climber. He was climbing the ranks of the Jewish world. He was being trained by the greatest of the great. And he had their ear, the Sanhedrin, he had their ear. And his main assignment was to go around that known area and find people that were Christians, take them captive, arrest them, bring them back to jail, and ultimately kill them. That was his job. And he thought he was doing God a favor to really just to annihilate those that name the name of Christ. And it's that guy, his name was Saul, 
he's going along one day heading to a certain next place he's going to arrest a bunch of folks that's what he's going to do and and jesus appears to him as a light and he knocks him to the ground his light the glory of god knocked him to the ground and instantly he physically became blind he couldn't see and he said who are you lord because he knew some living being had done this who are you lord and the answer was i am jesus whom you're persecuting from that point god became his lord he didn't know him before he knew of jesus he was trying to stamp out the residue of jesus still being on the earth but now he knew him and he was going to go through some things god said he was going to suffer a lot paul did but he said, all of that stuff that I counted as gain, you know what I'm talking about. If you look at some of the accomplishments of your life, which we're not saying they're bad things. But he said, all of that I count as loss for one thing, that I would know him. And he adds to that the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. A lot of people would rather he had left those nice couple of verses off words off yeah i want to know him and i want to know the power of his resurrection not so sure i want to know the fellowship of his sufferings or being conformed to his death but you see if we're not conformed to his death this whole package of this life is not getting complete because we've got to continue to take the old man to the cross i'm 69 years old and god still has me do that to this day taking the old man to the cross I'm not saying that I'm not saved, I'm saved. But there's an ongoing work of the cross of Christ in me that then is more perfected as I come out of the cross on the other side in the resurrection of something that's more alive. Giving up what I don't need for what I absolutely do. Hebrews talks about uh, laying aside the sin and the weight that so easily drags us down. Giving that up for something that's so much better. So much more perfect. Paul follows this up. I don't have it in your notes in Philippians 4. And he says, you know, let the peace of God rule in your heart. He said, come and offer the prayers and supplications to God and let God know your requests. And then he says, add it with thanksgiving. And he said, then let the peace of God that surpasses our understanding guard your hearts and minds. So we can not only know the love of God that we can't fully know all of it, but we can also know the peace of God that you can't fully appreciate the infinite size of His peace. And we can also have not only the peace and the joy, but also the love. Peace, joy, love. I can't understand all that, but I kind of do. I can talk about it, but I can't explain it all. So it is with some of these issues about the end times, as I said last week, and I'll say it again today. I know some things. I don't know it all. I don't think there's any human on the earth that does know it all. But see, that doesn't matter. Uh, Jesus said to his guys, you know, he was getting ready to fly away into a cloud. This was after the resurrection. He spent 40 days just periodically appearing to them. His last meeting with them before he left. And they were still, they still weren't getting it. They still didn't understand what was happening. And before he took off and flew into a cloud and disappeared in their presence, they said, well, is it, this, at, is it at this time you're gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking that he's gonna do what they think he's supposed to do. And that is raise up a Jewish army that will run Rome out and give them back their city and their area like they used to have it many years ago. And he said, you know, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that are kept with the Father. What he's saying is, that's not really the important part here. The important part is, is that he did say, I'm going to come back. And he did say, I'm going to be with you. But he said, I'm going to send the promise of the Father who is the Holy Spirit, because you're going to need the power, the dunamis, to be witnesses to me throughout the whole world. He said, that's what matters at the moment, is hearing the voice of God today, empowered by God today, doing what God wants me to do today. So it is nearly 2,000 years later 
since that day that Jesus literally flew away in a cloud. 2,000 years almost. It's still true today. We need to hear His voice. We need to be intimate with His Spirit and His Word, intimate with His people. Jesus answered the question to the young man one day, what's the greatest commandment? He said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which was in the law. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That was also in the law. He said, if you do that, you'll never fail. I paraphrase, but that's what he said. If you do that, you'll never fail. So this intimacy that five of the foolish maidens, uh, virgins, whoever they were, five of them were foolish. They weren't being intimate with the Lord. You know, I can picture it today, having been a pastor for quite a while. They probably were going to church. In their case, they were going to the synagogue. They probably were. They were probably around people that knew the Lord and honored the Lord and worshiped the Lord. They probably were. And I guess they thought they were just as much a part of this thing as, as all the others. But according to Jesus, five of them were not. They really didn't know the Lord. And how do we know that? Because Jesus said it. He said, I don't know you. Well, if he doesn't know them, they don't know him either. And so this is the key. So today, as I simplify my life at least, and as a pastor I'm trying to simplify things, it's so important that people be saved, be born again, empowered by the Spirit. All of these things are absolutely true. But how I really kind of put it down to a nutshell is I say, do you know the Lord? And you know something? When a person knows the Lord, they know they know the Lord. They know. Maybe they don't even stop and think about it the way I'm describing. But they know Him. And this is what we want to cultivate with the oil of His presence and let our light shine, which of course is what that metaphor parable would mean, is if you've got a lamp that doesn't have any light because the oil's not there, then the light's not shining. What was it the Lord said to you, Sherry? Why don't you share? Hang on just a minute. Let me get close. I think you had a dream, wasn't it? I did. I enjoyed that one. Let's hear it again. I dreamed that, on the whole dream or just the end? Whatever you want to tell. Oh. I dreamed that I was outside of a dark room and the people I loved were in that room. And I kept trying to get into the room and there was something in it pushing you back. And Liz was standing beside me and I said, we have to get those people. And I took her hand and I said, let's go because here comes the light because we're the light. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. Someday you'll need to write a song about that. <laughs> So, we can't be the light if we're not being intimate with the Lord, right? Isn't that true? That's not possible. Uh, the Lord gave me that place in the Old Testament about Jesus, uh, uh, a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. And, and I saw that later on. I've been around a lot of people through the years that their light is so dimly burning Oh, I, I believe they have some light in there. I really do. And I'm not saying this to fault them or to put them down. I'm saying for whatever reason, their light is so dimly burning, you almost can't even see it. And so what I've always tried to do, I'm not saying that I've done it well, but what I've tried to do with people through these many years is to find the light that is there and try to fan that light so it will, it will grow bigger and greater because you're going to have to go back to whatever light is there as faith. If it's light, it's there because of faith. So let's fan that faith until we get more faith going and they grow more in the Lord and their light starts getting more bright. But in the Isaiah in chapter 60, it says, Arise and shine, your light has come. It's a prophecy of the day in which we're living says, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And then it says this, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people. Does that sound like Sherry's dream? Darkness will cover the earth, 
deep darkness to people, that's, that's, a, that's an ignorance. It's, it's, you don't see. They don't see. They're blind. He said, but the Lord will arise over you and he, his glory will be seen upon you. And then he says, lift up your eyes and look all around and see all these, these people. They gather together and they come. They come to you. They come to us. What are they coming to? They're coming to the light. I don't know if you've ever known what it's like to be in a situation of total darkness. I'm talking about physical darkness. It's a dis disconcerting feeling to be in total darkness. And I've been in situations in, out in the, the woolies, out in the woods where we have been in my years growing up with my grandparents, when it's cloudy and there's no moon out. Dark is dark. You know, and if you don't have a light, that's kind of scary. And I had a pastor tell me years ago, I was going through a test of my own, and he said, you know, the Lord had shown him this. He said, sometimes we're going through stuff in our own life, and it seems like we're in a dark tunnel. And you look back, and you're not seeing anything but dark. You're looking forward, you're not seeing anything but dark. He said, so what the Lord showed him was to continue forward with what the last word of God was until you start seeing a glimmer of light out in front. And then you keep going forward to that glimmer until that glimmer starts growing brighter and brighter. That's what I'm trying to do with other people as well. Find that light. Well, in some cases, maybe there is no light in them at all. Maybe they haven't been saved. Maybe they don't know Jesus. So we're there to, to give them the light. But then there are others we're helping to fan the flame. So if you see me standing around doing this, that's what I'm trying to do is fan that flame. I am not looking for their faults. How many of you know it's real easy to see the faults in someone else? It's so easy to see, right? I mean, especially someone else. A little harder to see it in herself, but, but to see it in others. And I have found that you can approach people in one of two ways. Approach them by finding their faults and try to pound them for it. Or let's find the good that we can find. And let's try to do something with that. Craig, you want to help me out? <clears throat> okay. That was kind of easy, wasn't it? <laughs> Just came to me. Just came to me. The word of the Lord. See, a guy got his tire fixed. Father, it's been a long time for me. For you, it's not been a long time. I am so grateful that you knew me before the foundations of the world were framed, that you chose me in Christ, that you took me from my mother's womb and you've known me from long before I knew you. But you caused me to know you. You caused the light to come, the faith to come. And Lord, through these years, you've been doing a work in me to grow me, and I thank you for that. I thank you for your patience, your mercies that are new and higher than the heavens. I thank you for your love and your goodness to me and to our people. I thank you, Lord, that you've been working in me just like the rest of us, preparing us to be the bride, growing us up into maturity. And a big portion of that is us being sensitive to your presence, intimate with you, your voice, your word, your spirit, and your people. Being a people that, that know the love of God that actually surpasses knowledge. A people that, that can say with an assurance, Lord Jesus, I know you. What a beautiful, beautiful reality that we know you. And now, Lord, we're around people, some of which don't know you. And then there are some that do, but they don't know you very well. Give us that grace to let that light shine that Sherry was talking about in her dream. To break forth into the darkness and cause this light to shine in such a way that, that they'll be drawn to the light. They will want that light. They long for the light, that, that glory of your presence of your goodness, of your faithfulness. And Lord God, I thank you that there is a freedom that comes because we know you. 
There's no fear in perfect love because it casts out the fear and we're not afraid of, of a future judgment. We're not afraid of what might happen here on this earth because the love of God holds us very steady. And I thank you for that, Lord. So arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Lift up your eyes and see. Oh, lift up your eyes and see. Let's sing it one more time. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Lift up your eyes and see. Oh, lift up your eyes and see.